Hi everyone, my name is Brittany Clark. I'm a 2012 graduate of the School of Education and I'm excited to present to you the third installment of our Women of the U series. The Women of the U's mission is to support women and their initiatives and to have invigorating conversations surrounding women's issues. The first installment was a program called Go Past Stop, which was a program surrounding shattering glass ceilings, both internally and externally. The second installment of the Women of the U was Failing Forward, which was a conversation surrounding utilizing your setbacks as an opportunity or a tool to help catapult you and continue moving forward. So today I'm excited to have a conversation with Dean Cohn Wood, who is a professor and the Dean of our School of Education and Human Development here at the University of Miami. Well, Dean Conewood, it is so wonderful to meet you. I'm really excited to do this installment of the Women of the U with you, um, especially being a graduate of the College of Education over a decade ago. We don't, we don't need to count. Um, but I wanted to start with a little mental health check-in and uh, got this from another podcast, but on a scale of one to 10, how happy are you right now? Great question, especially post-pandemic, if we really can consider ourselves post-pandemic. Also, by training, I'm a clinical psychologist, so I think it's a wonderful question. Um, my answer, though, it's hard to say, because you know I think, like many of us, um, it's sort of up and down. If I had to give it like an overall meta, I would say eight, um, which yes. is pretty high, just because I feel uh, a lot of, I don't know, hope and optimism. I'm, by nature, an optimistic person, awesome. so eight. Love it, love it. Wanted to ask, because I, I think we definitely in this, like you said, post-pandemic world, if, if that's what we're in, we need to check in on our folks. And yeah. like I said, I'm really excited to do this with you, all about paying it forward. And I think as I reflected and we started to come up with questions, um, my spirit really landed in purpose. And mm -hmm. I wanted to talk with you about what your purpose is and how your purpose plays out in your actions and your decision making. Another great question. <laughs> um, I do believe very strongly, I'll quote Janelle Monet, who I heard on the radio once say, you know, it's important to walk in your purpose. Sure. Um, I uh, am the daughter of educators. Both my parents are teachers. My mother was an early childhood educator, a Montessori teacher, actually. And my dad was a high school English teacher at the public high school down the street from where we lived outside Seattle. So I feel very strongly about the power of education to not only sort of transform people's lives, which is, you know, sort of a platitude at this point, but really and truly it is the single best route for social mobility in this country. It always has been and it continues to be, even with people questioning the value of higher education or the kinds of things we do in higher education. Um, so to me, my purpose is to be able to advance the uh, power of education to have people be able to optimize their lives in whatever way you know they feel is important, whatever their their purpose is. So to me, that's a privilege that I get to do as part of this role, um, you know, every day. Awesome. And given you know that lens, that perspective, when we discuss and think about paying it forward, what does that mean to you? How does that resonate with you? Uh, you know, as you navigate your day. Um, to me, it is uh, putting people in the position to be able to be successful, particularly women, um, given that there's so many spaces still, even in 2023, sure. where we find ourselves the only or one of few, or um, maybe you know there hasn't been a, a, a strong uh, female uh, powerful leadership presence. So to me, it's making sure that we clear the space and create the opportunity for others. And then the other, um, it's really interesting. I have often the experience of students thanking me for, um, I don't know, writing letters of recommendation or um, you know, advocating for them in some kind of way. And um, my answer to them is always, you know, don't thank me, that's my job. That's actually what I'm here for. The way you can thank me is that when you get to the point where you are in a position to advocate or um, assist or help in ways um, that, that that's how you pay it forward. That's how you sure. thank um, those who who did it did it for you. And I certainly feel that because of you know my own education, where there were so many, countless you know people in small and large ways that helped um, me advance. So yeah. to me, that's really the point. That is awesome, and it it makes me think about intangibles, um, the things that you don't learn inside the classroom, and. 
What are those, some of those key skills, things you've picked up throughout your career um, that has helped you navigate, put yourself in a position to be successful, and then help position other people coming up behind you? You know, I, when I think of you know, sort of that question, what are those sort of intangible things that I wish I'd known? I mean, one of the first ones that comes to mind is, um, you know, again, it's sort of a cliche, but you're not gonna please all of the people all the time. And I think there is a sort of socialization, particularly for women, some men too, to kind of take care of people, make sure um, everyone's okay, you know, and that everything is nice. Um, and one of the things that I've found is that um, things aren't always nice because people, when you have to make tough decisions, people aren't gonna be happy. Sure. So um, just being aware that, uh, you know, you're just ne probably never gonna, there's always gonna be that person who you give maybe something that you think, make a decision that you think will please them, and they're gonna find a reason to right. criticize you either directly or indirectly. Yeah. Um, so that's related to my second thing, which is um, really that it's not about me, you know, and I think that's something in academia I had to learn early on, especially as a, a new professor, um, because your job is really dependent on publishing, so it's almost like your intellect, your job is dependent on how, you know, how smart you are, how, uh, how you're able to communicate the research or the truth finding that you do. Yeah. And you can get very um, sort of caught up, I think, in uh, your own self-worth being driven by that sort of process. Absolutely. And so early, early on, I tried to remind myself that, look, it's not about me. If, you know, if this doesn't work out, maybe it wasn't the right journal, or maybe this isn't the right institution, or maybe this isn't the right context in whatever way, so that you can kind of divorce your sense of yourself and your self-worth from you know, some of these things that happen in your professional life. Got it. So in the first part of your last answer, you mentioned something that I think is so huge and I want to tap into, decision making, particularly when you're making a decision that impacts a number of different people that often are thinking differently, have different perspectives, etc. cetera. Um, can you give us some insight into how you make difficult decisions and what you would tell someone coming up behind you that's tasked with a tough decision and feels like no matter what they do, someone's gonna be upset? So how, how do you navigate that? Yeah, it's tough. I think um, one is to go back to your purpose. So, you know, I think a lot of times we don't, um, explicitly define our own values, you know, or, or we don't enough, or we don't update them, you know, as life changes. So um, being able to know what your purpose is and then know what your values are and um, translate those into, you know, I mean, again, it's sort of business 101, but like a, a strategic priority or a strategic um, sort of stance for your unit or, you know, whatever it is you're responsible for. So then when you're having to make those difficult decisions, those are the things that guide um, the decision-making as well as the communication of the decision. So for example, during COVID, a lot of us, I mean, for the first time, it felt like higher ed was really under threat. I mean, I, you know, I used to think of higher education as sort of a, I don't know, recession-proof or a, you know, economy-proof yep. kind of industry. And then we were all faced with this huge unknown. So we had to make, you know, really difficult decisions, sure. all of us, um, in ways large and small. And I think you know, being able to think about what is the most important thing. How can we, um, for me, preserve this unit, which is all about transformation, social mobility through education, and then try to make decisions with that, you know, in the background. That's not to say that I didn't lose some sleep <laughs> during this time when we were all kind of struggling with right. what to do and how to do it best. Right, and there, I mean, there's no precedent for what we have all just experienced, right? And, you know, lean back to a mental health check-in and mm. we're all experiencing these things that none of us have ever had to experience and ever this new normal of a world that we're living in, um, which leads me to a point because you're in a role where you're making decisions that impact a lot of people. And a lot of people think that those are the only type of people who can make an impact or can pay it forward, et cetera. Do you, would you agree with you have to wait till you're at a certain point in order to make an impact or to pay it forward, help the people behind you, alongside you, et cetera? Or is this something that you can practice as you navigate throughout your career? Oh, you can completely navigate throughout <laughs> your career. I mean, one of the things I love about the University of Miami when I came here 14 years ago, and I would say the probably the biggest reason why I um, am able to be in the position I'm in now is that um, 
this is, you know, a new institution. It's relatively small. I mean, it's not tiny, but, sure. you know, 10,000 or so undergraduates. There's so much opportunity to do things here. And so I think what, um, what helped me a lot, especially coming from a much larger pond, the previous university where I was, um, was just showing up. You know, there's so many things to be, to be done. And so I, I feel like I sort of got to this position by just showing up and doing all of these things. Sometimes people look at my CV and they're like, wow, this is an incredible amount of service. <laughs> you know, and it's, it's, um, it's just that there were things that needed to be done. You show up and do them. You know, I know that there's a lot of um, concern now about sort of unpaid labor. I do think people should be compensated for their labor, but there's a lot of small things that people notice, even if it's not right. sort of a compensated or appointed kind of a, a role. Right. So to me, that, that showing up is huge because it sort of demonstrates your ability to, um, to be able to pay it forward, whether it's to, your, to a unit or to a person, but also the relationships that you develop oh in God. showing up in yep. all these different kind of disparate roles or places that need work, that is incredibly invaluable. So it's, it's not just that you're sort of assisting others, but you actually can reap some benefits as well. Yeah, for sure. I, I hear all the time showing up sometimes is more than half the battle because there are so many folks who, you know, you meet some type of um, barrier and it holds you back and, and you don't really get the opportunity to just be there and be present and learn. And um, there are so many things you can get from so many people and you never know who's watching. So I, I, I appreciate that answer. Very interested in this question and, and the differences between champions and mentors. Mm -hmm. Do you think there's a delineation between those two types of people? And if so, what are they? Yeah, I mean, I think someone can be both, a champion and a mentor. <laughs> but I think of a champion as someone who's really cheering you on, you know, someone who is really um, sort of invested and not just invested, but also like actively kind of helping you moving you through, advancing you in whatever your goals are. Whereas a mentor can be a, a, you know, something, something more of a passive relationship, whereas someone's providing advice, um, information, or resources. Um, again, I think someone can be both, but I can certainly look back and think of, you know, even, even now, people who have been active champions, reveling almost as much in any of the successes that I have, um, as much as I, as I or more, as, versus you know, people who have been very valuable mentors providing the kind of information and resources that I needed you know, to be able to get right. something done or to move along. So it's the, it's the action piece that so. delineates, and that's fair. And the joy piece, you know, like right. if someone really honestly, genuinely feels joy in your successes. What are some of the things that you know now mm. as an experienced professional that you wish you knew fresh out of college, kind of wet behind the ears, just ready to take on the world? What are, what are some of the tidbits, uh, areas of advice that you could bestow upon some young professionals? Well, I don't, you know, I, I, I don't know how exactly helpful <laughs> I can be because um, sometimes I think I look forward a, a lot more than I look backward. Yeah. So I don't know, maybe that's a piece of advice. Um, but one, <laughs> one thing I remember and something I tell students is um, that uh, I think initially when you're starting out in your career, you um, have a lot of angst about the decisions you make. I remember just even going back to graduate school, like where should I apply? Ah, where should I go? You know, blah. And feeling like, you know, it was just this life, you know, um, important decision, one path or the other, and then the next, you know, decision and the next. And um, one thing I found is that, um, you know, if you can kind of use, you know, obviously your intellect and your cognition to make these decisions, but also use some of your intuition and your sort of emotional response, which doesn't get a lot of credit. After, over time, as you start to make these decisions, almost like the momentum starts to carry you and your career, and you don't have to, you know, it doesn't feel as fraught to make, you know, this right. set of decisions. You make one decision, a new set of decisions open up, you make that one, and then, and then over time, it's almost like it's sort of you're, you're carried, um, maybe in places you never could have imagined when, you know, you were back making that first you know, really stressful decision. Yeah, I'm gonna agree with you in terms of your answer. As I reflect back, I think the decisions, every decision I made seemed so big. Mm -hmm. Everything seemed like if I don't make the right decision, it's gonna go completely haywire. And even the bad decisions kind of put you in this vortex of putting you towards what you were originally supposed yeah. to be doing anyway. Yeah. So um, appreciate, again, another wonderful answer. Do you think Paying it forward looks different for men than it does for women. Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, 
I, I mean, yes and no. I think in some ways it's probably the same idea, you know, that you're trying to um, make sure that you're um, doing for others as they've done for you by doing for others. But um, in other ways, I think for women, you know, honestly, I have this plaque in my office that says Empowered Women, Empower Women, and it's, again, sort of a cliche, but I think um, one of the things that happens, especially when we're in roles where maybe, you know, there's few of us or one of us or whatever it is, um, we feel competitive, you know, with each other as if there's only, you know, one, one person. And, um, and I, I, I remember facing this actually in graduate school with this, you know, I tend to be competitive. I used to play sports. Um, this other woman in my cohort, um, and at some point, you know, it was it was making me miserable. I felt like we were competing with each other to like be the smartest student in the room all the time. And <laughs> and you know, uh, at some point, you know, I said to myself, it takes two to compete. You know, I am not, you know, I'm not going to compete with her. I am me. She is her. You know, we both bring something to unique table. to the table, and we can be so much more powerful if we can join. I'm not sure we ever got to that point of being able to join, um, but I removed myself from the competition. And ever since then, I've tried to, you know, really act on that idea that, you know, as women, we need to be able to um, empower each other so that we don't find ourselves having to be in these roles. And that sort of cognitive and just, I don't know, energy burden of trying to be the one, the best, whatever, it takes up a lot of time and takes away a lot of your energy to do what you really need to do to be successful. Sure. And then conversely for men, what did you observe between pay, either paying it forward with men or you know, um, mentoring, championing men? What are some of the differences or some of the key um, things that you noticed amongst men and how they support one another um, and put themselves in positions to be successful? Well, one of the you know first things that comes to mind is there isn't um, the same questioning. Maybe like if someone you know endorses someone else or recommends them for a position or you know there isn't the same uh, you know uh, especially in those sort of more male-dominated spaces like questioning or um, concerns maybe raised. Um, uh, about you know either that endorsement or that person that they're endorsing it's sort of a given you know that you know I worked with this person or I trained this person they're good and it's okay everything's and it's great <laughs> you know and I feel like um, you know there isn't necessarily that burden of you know having to prove yourself um, or sort of demonstrate your worth in a way because you don't have that same kind of past you know so that's that's one thing I mean again not not always and right you know it may work differently for different people, I think particularly for women of color, yeah. it can be, you know, extremely um, off-putting, you know, yeah. whether it's conscious or unconscious um, for people to see you in, in particular roles. Oh, yeah. um, so again, I think the, you know, goes back to one of the things I said earlier, the more you can kind of realize that's their problem and not your problem and sort of divorce yourself from the energy that's taken up right. by, you know, ooh, I said something, is that going to be perceived as you know, in all these different ways. Um, the more you can free yourself up, it allows you to be yourself and then also, you know, bring all of yourself to whatever the role is. And I love that because as you speak, the, the word awareness or the phrase self-awareness comes to mind yeah. um, and how important it is as you navigate through your career. And I think it's something that's not really um, promoted or um, given the, uh, the right amount of credit as you enter a career field, given your psychology background. How important is self-awareness and, and getting to know who you are um, in navigating your career, et cetera, in terms of mentorship for, for other folks? How, how, how important has that been for you? Really important. I mean, I would say just even recently, I had the opportunity to um, attend a leadership program this past August where you know, they administered one of these, you know, sort of leadership profile survey things. And, you know, I was skeptical initially, like, I'm a psychologist. This is ridiculous. This is platitudes. This is Barnum statements, you know, which is kind of like astrology, like it applies to anyone. Right. Um, but I was shocked um, at the results um, because, you know, I thought I was pretty aware, but the things that um, came out in this assessment were incredibly helpful. So, for example, I scored low on influencer, which, um, you know, in, in many roles, that's, you know, being persuasive, being able to influence others is a key, you know, key aspect of the role. But I think, you know, it fit with sort of what I know about myself. I don't like to schmooze. I don't like a lot of small talk. I don't like lobby people. I don't really like meetings, so I'm not going to have like 15 extra meetings if it's not necessary. 
Um, but I think I, I've lost, you know, some of the ability to be able to then have people see, you know, the rationale behind decisions, et cetera. So anyway, the point of the leadership program was to see where you are strong and see where you are not, and then you can fill in your team with people who are strong in these various ways. Right. So it was incredibly helpful. So yeah, I think awareness is great. I mean, you can go down the road, road, uh, the road of navel gazing, that's not great. The right. point of awareness is to free you up to then not be so reactive to things that other people, other people's issues, right. and then also to be able to bring your whole self to, to your, your role. That is so awesome. Funny enough, I took the same thing, scored low on influencer. Really? And I, and I, the way it was described to me or explained to me was, I can often be such an action-oriented doer, mm -hmm. execution, that often I am, I'm not even interested in influencing. Just tell me what I need to do or what you need me to do so we can go and move to the next thing. So uh, very, very interesting. And I think it's been so helpful now that I'm aware yeah. about um, some of those things about me. I, I now know or am more informed when I navigate through life. So in your role, I would say as a dean and in your conversations with students throughout, um, are there any common themes in terms of, especially now in a post-pandemic world, what students are, are nervous about as they kind of enter real life, if you will? Um, is there anything that you're now seeing poking through a little bit more now that maybe you didn't see as much of pre-pandemic, -pre pre-COVID? Well, I think, you know, I Stu at least in my class, students really anxious. Um, the first class that I taught in person after um, the pan well, it wasn't after, it was still really kind of during the pandemic, um, I always do a little sort of confidential pre-semester, uh, pre or actually first class of the semester, um, kind of, uh, not really a survey, just a questionnaire um, asking, so I get to know students better. And um, what was remarkable, and I don't think I shared this with the students, was that of the, I don't know, 15 or so students, Two thir over two thirds mentioned something about anxiety, anxious, something related to being anxious. Yeah. Um, and uh, that was really interesting because I think even students who previously maybe entered classes feeling very self assured after this period, you know, everyone was, I was anxious, you know, it was incredible. So knowing that w was really helpful because then it kind of explained some other dynamics in the class, sure. which, you know, it just, seemed really hard to get people to sort of, you know, engage. I don't like to be the one, only one talking when I teach. Um, so I think that's one. Um, and then the other is something I was actually talking about with um, uh, someone else at the university and administration, and that is, it almost feels like there's a, a, a growing lack of trust in everything, you know, media, science, higher education, leaders, politicians, I mean, there's always been lack of trust politicians, right. but you know, <laughs> it's like, you know, it's like we have this generation who's, you know, coming up watching us fight about whether or not you should get a vaccination, whether or not you should wear a mask, whether or not right. you should vote, you know, right. and I just, um, it seems like um, it's not just disengagement, it's not just quiet quitting, it seems like there's just a sort of overall um, culture of maybe mistrust, and I think that really filters down to our individual relationships. Sure. Um, as well as, you know, sort of just our community and societal relationships. And, you know, that's something I, I definitely think we need to address, you know, right. in, in whatever way. I mean, I have some ideas about how we can address it in some of the things we do in the School of Education and Human Development, but um, I think there's something like that kind of going on, you know, for all of us. Yeah, and it's so interesting because, you know, Gen Z is in college right now, but they're also joining our workforce. So now, um, especially in a human resources role, we're seeing five, up to five generations, depending on uh, where you work in the same workplace. And in terms of paying it forward and in terms of purpose, I feel grounded in, in helping people communicate with each other because there does seem to be a different level of, and maybe it is mistrust, but it's, it's almost like no one's speaking the same language right now and there's a lot of miscommunications that happen all over. So one of the things that we started in the School of Education and Human Development to kind of, I think, um, help with this issue of people not being able to speak across difference or across perspectives is an intergroup dialogues uh, program, which um, is a set of courses that um, allow students to bring their perspectives into class and um, engage in dialogue. It's a pedagogy, so it's not discussion, it's not debate. And the idea isn't that you're going to change anyone's mind or, you know, shift anyone's thinking, but rather that as people bring their differing perspectives based on their life experience, their family socialization, their, you know, 
college experiences into the classroom supported by readings and assignments. You're able to understand why someone might believe a particular idea about something or why they might hold a particular value. And that kind of shared understanding then allows you to, I think, be able to be productive going forward. So you understand how to engage and be productive with people who may be very different from you. And that to me is critical because I think that's not happening at least what we hear from employers is that's one of the biggest difficulties. Right. So we started this intergroup dialogues um, set of courses um, and we're um, hoping to start a new uh, cognate that is kind of like, you know, soft skills for individuals going out into the workplace where you learn about, you know, sort of listening, um, but you also learn about how to engage in dialogue and understand other people's um, perspectives without shouting at each other on social media. Oh, yeah, that's, and, and again, it brings me back to communication. And I'm wondering your thoughts on how students learn now. Have you noticed a shift in how students are learning and intercepting information and applying said information to whatever assignments or what, discussions, et cetera? Is there a difference? Oh my gosh, that is like a, a question that would require a whole, you know, another Better. hour, <laughs> but it's so important. So one of the things I've done is um, co-lead this effort called PEDAL, which is the Platform for Excellence in Teaching and Learning at the university. And the idea behind PEDAL is that because of what you just said, the way in which information and um, technology has assisted the dissemination of information, we need to do something different in the classroom. We can no longer just sit up on, you know, it's called sage on the stage, stand up and lecture with PowerPoints and then, right. you know, we're good. So it's, uh, PEDAL is this uh, university-wide initiative to try to help our professors learn how to apply different kinds of pedagogies like active learning, problem solving, discussion-based pedagogy, because students can get information on their phone. Um, so we need to figure out what their time in the classroom should be best used for, and that is to do exactly what you just said apply the information that you can access right. in ways that helps them problem solve, translate to the real world, yeah. et cetera. The other big thing that's happening is, you know, the, um, the chat bot or whatever it's called that can write a paper for you, you know, no matter what, you know. Right. So to me, that's um, interesting, but it's also, <laughs> I think it creates this nice challenge for us in universities to figure out how can we um, figure out ways for students to demonstrate what they've learned, assess what they've learned, that's not, you know, go out and write a paper because right. now the computer will write the paper for you. Right. Um, so I, I think these are all like really interesting challenges that um, as a school of education, we're right. you know, sort of trying to lead um, in, in, in innovating. So going back to our conversation regarding champions and mentors, something that came to mind was the thought of or the action of raising your hand in a room where who you're championing or who you're mentoring is not in that room. What does that look like? How has that played out? How important it is, is it for us to do that for one another? That process can look differently depending on you know what it is. So sometimes I think that raising your hand for others in the room is more of a meta process. So like mm -hmm. for example, if you are the only person in the room that represents a particular um, social identity or demographic or perspective, um, but a p decision is about to be made or you know being discussed that will impact that identity or demographic, sometimes raising your hand to be a champion is more in the aggregate and trying to make sure that what's on the table is the perspective of whomever it, you know, it is that's being um, you know, discussed. So like for example, DEI is a big thing in higher ed right now. Um, people uh, talk a lot about how can we create accessible pipelines. Um, some of that I think is a survival thing because you know enrollments are dropping, the sure. college age population is declining. Right. Um, so you wanna make sure that in that conversation are uh, you know, the, uh, the ideas and perspectives and sort of an understanding of what it means to be an accessible or a, you know, a, a campus that is um, not just you know, tolerating or welcoming, but really um, giving students ownership over the sure. institution itself so yeah. that they then feel um, empowered enough to not only have an outstanding experience, but also to be able to give back. But other times it really is more of an individual kind of raising your hand. Like, have you thought about this person, their skills are excellent in this way? And that I think there's you know, almost unlimited, depending on you know, your context, opportunities to do so because as I was saying, um, I think there sometimes is a, a, a gender imbalance. You know, people sure. often talk about, um, well, we tried to hire uh, blah, 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 because, but there, there wasn't a pool, you know, there wasn't enough of a pool. 
we are creating the pool. You know, yeah. we are the pool. <laughs> yes. You know, yes. so if we're not creating the pool to be more whatever it is, yeah. then we only have ourselves to blame. Right. And you can't use that as an excuse. We are the pool. Right. So that's another kind of example. And sometimes there are people in the pool. It's just that in a number of ways they maybe haven't been able to raise the hand for themselves. If there's right. anything I've learned in academia in this role and several leading up to it is there is seems to be a pattern of a gender difference in how people portray their skills and abilities and um, what we might consider um, distasteful bragging. Others, you know, have no problem saying, I am the foremost world's best expert in X whatever. <laughs> right. You know, whereas we say, well, I worked on this, I contributed to that, I was a co-lead on this. You know, so to me, sometimes the, the pool is there, it's just that they haven't structured, you know, their persona or their materials or whatever it is, and you have to be the one to say, look, over here. Right. You know? And it's so interesting because I'm hearing responsibility because it, that there is a level of burden for that person raising their hand and it, you are responsible because whomever you're championing has to then come in and, and do their thing. Um, I'm hearing responsibility for others and being aligned in terms of purpose. If we are going to take a diverse workplace, a diverse campus, whatever, seriously doing the hard things to ensure that that actually happens getting to the table, right? And, and and being at the table, feeling confident enough to be heard and to speak up. So I heard a lot of things in that answer. So thank you so much, so much to learn from and pull from. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you for joining us for this third installment of the Women of the U series. To get involved with the Women of the U, email alumni at miami.edu. Women of the U supports the Women's Scholarship Fund to make a donation, visit give.miami.edu.